Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for Office Hours with Noam Chomsky on this beautiful Tuesday afternoon. Um, before I go any further, though, it is important that I acknowledge that we are holding this Q&A on the campus of the University of Arizona, which sits on the original homelands of indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. We respectfully acknowledge the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Odom and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign Native nations and Indigenous communities through education offerings, partnerships, and community service. My name is Ali Devereaux. I am a senior here at the University of Arizona, and I am the ASUA Executive Vice President. I will be moderating this Q&A today, and I am so happy you all are here, whether you're on our beautiful campus here in Tucson or remote wherever you live around the world. Here assisting with me today is Sydney Mathis, a senior majoring in law, Spanish, and Portuguese, and she is the ASUA Center for the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. Speaking with us today is, of course, the incredible Professor Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky, who joined the University of Arizona faculty in fall 2017, is a laureate professor in the Department of Linguistics in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. He is also the Agnes Nelms Howery Chair in the Agnes Nelms Howery Program in Environment and Social Justice. Professor Chomsky is one of the most influential public intellectuals in the world and is the founder of Modern Linguistics. He is an American linguist, philosopher, cognitive scientist, historian, social critic, and political activist. Professor Chomsky is also a major figure in analytic philosophy and is one of the founders of the field of cognitive science. He first worked at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he established a new graduate program in linguistics. We now have the privilege of having him here on our staff at the University of Arizona. And as an undergraduate student, you can now take courses with him about the meaning and importance of language in our society. We did receive the questions you submitted when you were signing up and we will be using your submissions, but unfortunately we can't get to all of them, but you can also submit live questions to us using the Q&A button on the bottom right of your screen. Please make sure to include what college you are in in your submission. But without further ado, let's get started. Um, so Professor Chomsky, our first question actually comes from me. Um, so what would you say are the biggest changes you've noticed in our culture since the pandemic, whether that's linguistically, politically, socially, or anything else? Well, of course, people have learned how to work individually, uh, speaking as a lecturer, I've learned how to try to do things virtually instead of in person. We face serious challenges. Uh, the problem, it is known how to overcome the pandemic, but that requires a cooperative attitude an attitude of willingness to be concerned for others. Uh, it's countries where that has been, where it's taken for granted in the culture have done quite well. Uh, the Asian countries and Oceania particularly, which have emerged from the crisis quite effectively. Few others. Uh, where those commitments to cooperation, concern for the community are less in place, less widespread, there have been problems. We're unfortunately a mixture. If you look at the map of uh, hot spots, where are there? serious uh, epidemics, uh, it's pretty telling. It's, uh, uh, these are problems in the culture that have come to, are there and have been intensified during the crisis. There's another thing we should bear in mind. This isn't gonna be the last pandemic. There was a major pandemic in 2003, SARS epidemic, that one was contained. But scientists pointed out at the time that uh, we should be prepared for another one. And it might be a worse one. 
there are lots of other possible coronavirus uh, that, that could uh, develop, turn into a crisis. Steps were barely taken. We're now hearing the same warnings and uh, we will either listen to them and respond and be in a position to fend off and overcome the next crisis when it comes or else we'll be vulnerable to something that's even worse. There's another thing we should have learned. The rich countries have monopolized the vaccines for themselves and have been insistent on protecting the profit rights of the major corporations instead of following the model of the so-called people's vaccine, ensuring that the vaccine goes to the poor and vulnerable suffering all over the world who desperately need it, and that for the period of the pandemic, at least, there's much more to say to that about that. The uh, stringent property rights should be relaxed so that others could produce and manufacture vaccines and reach the world. This is not only, I should say in this respect, the US record is somewhat better than that of Europe, which has been the strongest especially Germany, in insisting that the monopolies be maintained for the wealthy countries and for the pharmaceutical corporations. But no one has a good record on this. And uh, it's not only morally outrageous, but also suicidal, and it's known. The more the virus has an opportunity to mutate, the greater the chance that we'll get new and possibly more harmful variants. That's how the current Delta variant emerged. So it's morally objectionable or worse and uh, basically suicidal. But somehow we can't seem to rise above that. It's not the only issue. Same is true of much more important issues like global warming, threat of nuclear war. It's not a good prognosis for the human species unless this can be overcome. And kind of in that same vein of eminent war, <laughs> um, do you support the recent withdrawal of US troops in Afghanistan? And what are your thoughts on that whole thing? Well, you can look back to what I wrote or I can send it to you, what talks I gave a couple of months before. Uh, personally, uh, the die was cast in February 2020 when President Trump uh, uh, negotiated with the Taliban, excluding the Afghan government. They were not invited, even informed. Of course, excluding the Afghan people. Nobody pays attention to them. Uh, he made an arrangement with the Taliban that the U.S. would withdraw in May 2020, 2021, worst possible time, onset of the fighting season, no time to prepare, to accommodate. Uh, uh, he told that the agreement was the Taliban were free to do anything they wanted, as long as they didn't fire on American troops, no other conditions. It's a disaster in the making. Uh, well, Biden somewhat improved it. He extended the period a couple of months, uh, added some minimal conditions, uh, but it's nevertheless, it, it was plain very early that as soon as the American support was withdrawn, the Afghan army would collapse, realize it's not a viable independent army, and uh, the government, which is a morass of corruption with no support, popular support, would collapse and in fact 
flee as it did. It was all pretty obvious months in advance. Uh, uh, well, withdrawal, I think, was the right thing to do, but in a manner that followed the concerns and interests of the Afghan people. They are the ones who should have designed, developed the program for the withdrawal. We should have followed them. That doesn't mean the government, which was a corrupt non-entity, but the population itself. They were never brought into the discussion and they should have had a prominent role in it. There had to be withdrawal. The United States had no right to invade in the first place. His presence was making the situation worse, but uh, the manner of the withdrawal it could have been done in a more civilized way. And that was undercut once Trump made the original decision. It was, could have been somewhat improved after that, but not very much. Yeah. And that question was from the College of Science, by the way. Um, and this next question is from the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. Um, Dennis Kucinich has said that we have a war economy. Can you tell us why you agree or disagree with him? We've had a war economy for all, almost all my life since the Second World War. Never went off a war economy. Immediately after the war, the United States was in a position of absolutely overwhelming power and security and wealth. There had been nothing like that in human history. Uh, the United States had maybe almost half of the wealth of the world, uh, controlled the whole hemisphere, controlled both oceans, controlled the opposite sides of both oceans, other industrial societies had been devastated. Uh, the US, US economy actually gained through the war. Manufacturing production virtually quadrupled. The United States had been the richest country in the world for long before, an amazing position. Well, there was hope at the time, which I remember very well for what was called a peace dividend Let's move to a peacetime economy. And that was dashed very quickly by development of a conflict, which I don't think was necessary. And in retrospect, I think it's clear that it was unnecessary. Uh, the Russians were depict, depicted as a horrendous, uh, monstrous force uh, seeking to conquer the world. If you look at the internal documents that have been declassified, it's pretty shocking. Look at NSC 68, the main document, 1950, which called for a huge buildup of the war economy, depicts the Russians as a slave state, which has a a mission that is part of their nature. They can't escape it. The mission is to conquer and suppress the whole world. In fact, there were knowledgeable, very knowledgeable commentators like analysts like George Kennan, who'd been the head of the State Department policy planning system, a Soviet expert. He said, no, this is not true. We don't like them, do a lot of things wrong but they're not an aggressive power, they're a weak power. He was thrown out. Every China specialist in the country was expelled. It was left in the hands of war hawks, people like liberals, incidentally, Dean Acheson, Secretary of State, who made it clear that he said, we have to make things clearer than truth to force the mass mind of the government to follow our policies. The leading uh, uh, senator on foreign affairs, Robert uh, uh, Vandenberg, Republican said, we have to scare hell out of the country. Otherwise we'll never get them able to accept this war-based system that we're developing. Well, that happened. 
one thing after another. It's very interesting to look in the details if there's time I could talk about it. But manufactured crises have been developed over and over, uh, maintaining the war economy, the war military-based economy, huge military budget. Our military budget is roughly three quarters of a tri almost a trillion dollars if you add everything up. The next largest military budget in the world is China, which is about a quarter of a billion dollars uh, per capita, far less. Russia is $60 billion with below India. Uh, but nevertheless, we're being prepared now for another massive war-based economy uh, with uh, confronting China, which is insanity square. There cannot be a conflict with China it would destroy everything. There are problems that can be dealt with by diplomacy and negotiations, as has been the case all along. And we have to move in that direction simply for survival. So we're in the midst of another example of what we've lived with, I've lived with almost all my life, 75 years. And it's unnecessary and very dangerous. Yeah. Um, this next question is from the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. And it is, should high level social media companies be allowed to ban people for offensive speech, even officials like the President of the United States? Well, personally, I was not in favor of that. I mean, I could see an argument for banning Trump for maybe a week, the last week of his presidency, when he was plainly out of control. And it was not very, he might have done something extremely dangerous. That's why the top general, with the accord of other militaries, informed China, don't take seriously anything that happened, might happen. That was a very dangerous moment. So I think he could make a case for a temporary ban, but I was not in favor of the longer term ban. As far as offensive speech is concerned, there has to be some limit. I think myself that the basic principle is the one that was established by the Supreme Court in 1969. Brandenburg v. Ohio, the most important free speech uh, judgment of the Supreme Court, it was incidentally on a case involving the Ku Klux Klan, uh, not nice people. And their decision was that speech should be free up until participation in imminent criminal acts. So for example, if you and I go into a store to rob it and you have a gun and I say, shoot, that's not protected speech. Uh, there's a range of interpretation, of course, like all laws has a, a number of interpretation, but I think that's close to the principle we should keep to. When speech is really dangerous, imminent danger, participating in imminent danger, then it's justified to have a ban. In other cases, I think a heavy burden of proof has to be met to ban speech. And in my opinion, it can rarely be met. This next question is from the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. What is the best piece of advice you could give to a young person today? Well, I'm asked that very often. And the first thought that comes to mind is not to take seriously any advice that you hear, especially from people who don't know you very well. The answers to these questions have to come from within. There's no general advice. I never tried to give advice to my own children. They knew where I stood on things. They then had to find their own way. And I think that's the same for all of you. You have to find your own way. P 
people can have suggestions. I could make some suggestions, shouldn't take them very seriously, but there's no general advice. There's individual choices that have to be made in the light of in personal individual circumstances. But maybe older people can help out with information, background, uh, experience, and so on. But it's just a store of experience and information, sometimes knowledge, sometimes error, uh, which you can draw from on your own. So maybe the advice is to just follow yourself, maybe. <laughs> Not Don't listen to me, maybe, is the advice. <laughs> the best advice, uh, I think, was given 2,500 years ago by the Delphic Oracle, which had the maxim, know thyself. Figure out who you are, honestly, where you belong in the world, what the world is like. Do it with humility, with care, with concern for others, and find your way. I think that's great advice. Um, so this next question is from the College of Science, and they ask, what hope is there in wealth equity if our democracy feeds into the wealth power vicious cycle? Uh, what hope? Disaster. No hope. This has been happening for the last 40 years. It was bad enough before. For the past 40 years, there have been programs, government programs, business programs, which have been carefully designed so as to radically increase wealth uh, inequality to lead to sharp concentration of wealth in a very narrow part of the population with the, most of the rest living in a, really a majority by now, living in a relatively precarious situation, a real wages for non-supervisory workers are actually lower than they were in real terms than 40 years ago, while enormous wealth has accumulated. This has led to a, it's not just here, it's happened to a certain extent all over the world, more extreme here, all from the same policies, so-called neoliberal policies, which were designed so that they would have this effect. And there are now some and it's led to anger, resentment, fear, irrationality, hatred, breakdown of the social order, pretty much what you'd expect from such policies. It's true here, it's true elsewhere. Uh, there's actually been some efforts to measure it uh, by high level research institutions. The most careful was done by the Rand Corporation highly regarded quasi-governmental research institution. Now, their estimate was that over the past 40 years, uh, al almost $50 billion had been transferred from the lower 90% of the population to the top fraction of 1%. That's pretty impressive, and it's a vast understatement. When Ronald Reagan entered office, initiated these programs, he basically opened the spigot on lots of other options, tax havens, uh, stock buy buybacks, uh, rules of corporate management, which allowed CEOs to basically set their own salaries, uh, all sorts of other things. You add all this up, it probably comes to, I said billion, I should have said trillion dollars. It comes to roughly probably seven or $80 trillion taken from the lower 90% of the population, working class, middle class. And if you look at where it went, uh, it's mostly to a fraction, a fraction of 1% of the population. 0.1% of the population 
has doubled their share of wealth from 10% to 20%, which is astonishing. Well, these are policies don't have to be pursued, can be reversed. There are in Congress right now, debates going on as we talk about efforts to do at least something about this. The Biden administration has put forth programs which if enacted would substantially uh, overcome some of the extreme harm that's been caused, not only to people, but even to the infrastructure of the society, which is collapsing. Well, they're, they're in a very tenuous position now. The Republicans are 100% opposed, no break. Among the Democrats, the those who are called moderate for some reason, I would call them right-wing Democrats, like our re senatorial representative, are opposed. They want to cut it back. Chances are, won't go through. Major a major opportunity will very likely be lost to uh, begin to compensate for the harm that's been caused by, by the policies of the past 40 years, which have been extremely harmful to our society and to many others that have been subjected to the same policies. And we're right at a turning point now. Popular action could make a big difference if there was popular activist engaged protest against this, could make a difference. Congressional representatives aren't immune to popular pressure. They may disregard it, but they're not immune to it. This next question is from the College of SBS, and it is, how do you respond to Kant's categorical imperative, and how do you feel about Rawls's A Theory of Justice? Rawls's Theory of Justice. Uh, Rawls actually was a personal friend. We discussed this book when it was coming out. Actually, his the original version of his book, it not that it was published, was actually based in part on grammatical models, the kind that it was working on. He received so much criticism for that that he withdrew it. But there's now a subsequent book by a fine young philosopher, John Mikhail, M-I-K-H-A-I-L. He's now a professor of law at Georgetown. Uh, he did a thesis in a book in which he argued that the original model was the correct one and that if you pursued it, you could develop an approach to developing a theory of justice, which actually had roots in human moral nature, the our innate moral nature, open experimental work on this, others have now carried it on. But Rawls's book was a major contribution. It reframed thinking uh, for a generation about uh, the nature of justice, about fairness, uh, so on. You could agree or disagree with it, but it was carefully done, very thoughtful. Same is true of his lectures on moral philosophy, which have been published, which are marvelous introduction to the subject. Uh, personally, I personally, I don't quite agree with a lot of the conclusions, but they certainly have to be taken very seriously. And what about um, Kant's categorical imperative? Well, categorical imperative is nice to say, but Nobody's going to live up to it. It's nice to think about, but uh, if your child is being uh, on the verge of being run over by a car, and there's another child nearby who you, you don't know who's being in the same predicament, uh, you know what you're going to do.
And both of these questions come from the College of Science, but they seem kind of similar. Um, what role does media play in shaping linguistics? And do you think modern grammatical theory properly explains this evolution of human language with social media? Well, what's changed by social media is usage of language, not language. The language itself emerged, it seems, roughly at the time that modern humans emerged, narrow period, and it hasn't changed since. The faculty of language, as far as we know, is shared among all humans. They seem to speak very different languages, but when you look closely, one of the main discoveries of modern linguistics and cognitive science is that when you look closely, they're not very different. They're fundamentally based on the same mold. Same incidentally has been discovered about organisms. If you go back 50 or 60 years, biologists assume that organisms are so different that uh, each has to be studied on its own. They could vary in almost all possible ways. It's now known that they're all virtually identical. They are based on the same principles, deep uh, principles that don't change. Uh, uh, it's gone to the point where some serious molecular biologists have suggested there may even be a universal genome uh, with minor modifications. It's not accepted, but it's not considered absurd. What does change is usage. So your use of language is going to be somewhat different from my use of language because of peer pressures, generational changes, and so on. Uh, when I listen to my grandchildren, it's a lot different from the way I talk, but it's the same language. And it hasn't changed for probably a couple hundred thousand years. And this next question um, comes from the College of Science. What are your thoughts on the United States version of capitalism and what steps, if any, do you believe should be taken to combat all of its shortcomings? Well, there are narrow questions and deeper questions. If we look at the evolution of American capitalism, which I think should be called state capitalism, there are no truly capitalist countries. A country that was truly capitalist would self-destruct in no time. Uh, the people who Adam Smith called the masters of mankind, the main manufacturers, merchants, business interests, uh, they would never permit capitalism. They want a powerful state to intervene to protect them from the ravages of the market. We see this constantly. The last 40 years, there's been crash after crash after Reagan initiated the period of, actually Carter initiated, Rader extended the period of deregulation, so financialization, so crash after crash. Each time the government, that means the population, has to step in to rescue the perpetrators. Now, that's always been true to some extent. In fact, a large part of the technology that we enjoy, the vaccines that we use, come from government spending. Very substantial part. Business wants the public to take the risks and pay the costs and they'll make the profits. So it's state capitalism. But it's gone through various periods, starting in the 1930s, my childhood, there was the initiation in the United States of moves towards social democracy. While Europe was moving towards fascism, the United States was leading the way towards social democracy under the New Deal. Big, bitter struggle. I remember it very well. Uh, but it achieved quite a lot. 
Well, that lasted, was on hold through the war, picked up again at the end of the Second World War with a major struggle, major business effort to reverse it, major popular effort to sustain and expand it. That conflict went on for 20, 25 years. Finally, the business interests prevailed. And we had uh, moved into a, well, the, that period was sometimes called regimented capitalism. The state played a powerful role in, in maintaining uh, taxation, which was moderately progressive, uh, controlling financial institutions. Banks were banks, not uh, firms making risky investments, which the government would bail them out for if they collapsed. Uh, it was, a, it was the, the greatest period of growth in, in American history, capitalist history, and pretty egalitarian growth. The lowest quintile did about as well as the highest quintile. Uh, this is the Eisenhower period, the 1960s began early in the 70s began to change it was a major business counteroffensive began to move towards what became the neoliberal programs and which made huge changes were made leading to the system that i've to what i described since uh basically stagnation for the majority enormous wealth for a tiny percentage crisis after crisis as the effects of financialization and deregulation took place. Uh, such a change in the tax structure that for the first time in a century, billionaires actually pay a lower rate than people who work for them. Uh, well, all of, going back to the narrow and broader kinds of reform, the narrow kind of reform could be a return to a form of social democracy. Uh, in the post-war period, Europe picked up and developed further the kinds of social democratic policies that had been pioneered in the United States. So if you take a look at European countries now, they're quite different than us. Uh, take Germany. In Germany, a working person has two months of paid vacation automatically. It's universal health care, uh, free higher education. Uh, if a couple has a baby, they get about, I think, 14 months of joint maternal and paternal leave. There's child care provided, many amenities provided. Now, you'll see, you can read some economists who will say, well, the sacrifice by having lower GDP per capita. Yeah, if people work two months less, GDP is going to be less. But maybe leisure is something worthwhile. Okay, that's possible. Americans have almost none of this. In fact, if you that there there are popular forces moving towards it. Bernie Sanders is the most outspoken figure. But if you take a look at Sanders's policies, by European standards, it's a normal. In fact, one of the editors of the world's leading business journal, Financial Times in London, quipped that if Sanders was running in Germany, he could be running on the Conservative Party program which is pretty much true. He's calling for universal health care. Almost everybody has outside the United States. Both of our neighbors, for example, Canada and Mexico, Europe, Brazil, anywhere you look, free higher education. They have it not very far from us in Mexico, much of Europe, elsewhere. Uh, these are important moves they would move the United States back towards the center of the 
rich developed societies in terms of concern for welfare of the population. It's being, there's a struggle about it right now in Congress, which I mentioned. We don't know which way it'll go. The Biden programs wouldn't lead to this, but they'd be a step towards it. So that's the kind of change which I think can, is easily feasible to say, let's go back to the economy of the Eisenhower years. Doesn't sound terribly radical, okay? Eisenhower himself said that anyone who questions New Deal measures doesn't belong in our political system. Uh, by now, they're not only questioned, but rejected by much of the political system. Well, that's a narrow change. I don't incidentally want to glorify those years. There was plenty wrong with them, but we're talking about a narrow question. Now, what about a further question? Well, it's worth thinking about. For about 2000 years of Western history, it was taken for granted that the worst assault on human rights and human dignity was to be subservient to some other person, to take orders from a master. We have a phrase for that. It's called getting a job, meaning for your an almost entire waking life, you're a servant to a master. You follow orders in a manner for most working people that's worse than what exists in totalitarian states. Uh, Stalin, for example, couldn't tell you uh, you can only go to the bathroom at three o'clock in the afternoon for five minutes and you can't talk to anybody on the way there and you have to wear these clothes and you have to move on this path if you're an Amazon worker, not on a different path. And we monitor you to make sure you're doing it. That's called having a job for most people. Right through the 19th century, that was considered an abomination. If you look back at American history, the late 19th century, there were two huge popular movements. One was the radical farmers movement. This was an agrarian country at the time. Farmers in Texas, uh, Kansas, Oklahoma joined together, decided they wanted to be free of the control of Northeastern bankers and market managers to run their own affairs to create what they called a cooperative commonwealth in which farmers would get together and collectively run their own affairs. In parallel to this, in the industrial east, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, uh, a working class movement was developing, created a huge labor movement, Knights of Labor, which was incidentally uh, some of its first activities were organizing black workers in Louisiana. It was biracial, uh, plenty of flaws like everything, but uh, fundamentally working for the same goals, cooperative commonwealth. Workers should own and manage their own enterprises. We should never have to follow orders of a boss. We should never have our labor stolen from us by someone who owns capital. That was the motto. The Knights of Labor and the Farmers Movement was then called the Populist Movement, different, not what populism means today. Uh, they began to get together. If they had, it would be a very different country, a country with real radical democracy. Uh, they were crushed by state and corporate force the United States has a very violent history of a labor history, much more so than comparable countries. But these are further things that we might think about. I don't think they're far below the surface. So that's a much farther goal. Should we accept a system in which some people take orders, others give them, and that's almost your entire waking life? I think that's a question worth considering.
kind of in that similar vein. Um, what do you think of the phrase, aren't we more free when our basic needs are met? And what do you say to libertarians who would not want to sacrifice their private property rights for an ideal like this? Well, what are property rights? I mean, you have a right to the property that you use. Definitely, nobody's questioning that. Do you have a right to property that you don't use, but that you employ to rent people to make profit from you? That's another question. Do you have a right to, to be demanding a society in which power is concentrated in very few hands, which are basically totalitarian. They have total control over everything they do. Everyone else has a right to rent themselves to them for survival. Well, that's another question. Do you have a right to interfere with another person's right? Well, if you have, if you have an estate which nobody else can live on, and you're not using it, you're interfering with other people's rights. In fact, the biggest popular movement in the world, and one of the most important, about which not enough is known, is what's called the landless workers movement in Brazil. It's a movement of working people, peasants, farmers, who occupy lands that are owned but not used by rich landowners. They face plenty of harassment. Police come in, armies come in, corporate paramilitaries come in, try to drive them out. But they've made substantial gains large parts, and they've moved on to form something like the kind of cooperative commonwealth that radical farmers in the United States were trying to develop back in the late 19th century. Uh, it's a pretty impressive movement. One of the courses that I co-taught last fall, last winter, one of the sessions had a spokesperson from from them describing their activities. Uh, these are the kind. It's a, it's a country, sort of. You know, it's not as rich as the United States, obviously, but basically structured in a similar way. Well, those are possibilities. So, if you really ask what the so-called American libertarians are calling for, they're basically calling for tyranny. They're calling for a system in which people will have the capacity to amass property and wealth without limit, without interference, and use it to dominate and control others who will have no choice. I should say, if you want a personal anecdote, uh, I was introduced to libertarian thought 70 years ago when I was a graduate student at Harvard. And there was an invited lecture by the, uh, the guru of the libertarian movement, Ludwig von Mises, Austrian libertarian. He gave a speech on, uh, I attended it, on why the government is responsible for unemployment. That was his speech and it was accurate. What he said is, Suppose that some guy is starving and I'm a rich owner and I offer him a miserable job for 10 cents an hour under horrible conditions. Well, he's starving. He'd probably take it. But the, then the evil government steps in and imposes regulations saying you have to pay people enough to live on. You have to have safety conditions. And because of that, he can't take the job. The evil government is forcing him to be unemployed. Now, if we had a real libertarian society, he'd be free to take the job. If we could only get the government off our back. Well, I was watching the faces of the graduate students at Harvard. A fair number of them accepted that. They're the ones who go on to be rich 
corporate lawyers and executives and libertarians. There were others who were horrified. They went in a different path. So almost taking you back to that age, if you were around 19 years old today, what would you be doing and why? This is from the College of SBS. Well, I could tell you what I was doing then, but what I was doing then was deciding, is it even worthwhile to continue with college? It's stupid and ridiculous. I want to do something else. And by a series of accidents, I stayed in the university system. And in retrospect, I'm very glad that those accidents took place. Uh, but as to what I would be doing today, probably something not well thought out. That's the age. Uh, should say that there's actually a gender difference. Women's brains mature at around 20 or so. Men's brain, brains don't mature until maybe five years later and shows up in many ways. Uh, but uh, you can make a lot of mistakes, but which is not terrible. You have time to correct them. But uh, there are things that really should be done, definitely. And uh, lots of young people are doing them. A couple of days ago, there was a Friday, I think, there was a climate, an international climate strike. That was young people. Huge numbers in Europe. Germany featured Greta Thunberg. Other countries mean huge demonstrations. Almost all young people. They are in the forefront of trying to save humanity from self-destruction. It's shameful that it has to be young people. It's shameful that Greta Thunberg had to stand up at an invited talk at the Davos meetings, the meeting, annual meetings of the rich and powerful, the masters of mankind. And she had to get up and give a talk ending with, you have betrayed us, which is correct. My generation, next younger generation, have betrayed the youth of the country. We have knowingly created a situation that they're going to inherit. I won't be here, but you will, in which it may be impossible for humans to survive in an organized form. We've known for decades, what has to be done about this. I mean, more information is coming along. Latest IPCC report on August 9th gave a much more dire analysis than in the past, but the basics have been understood since the 1980s. And the opportunity was lost. If it had been taken 40 years ago, be a lot easier to handle. If it, if it had been undertaken 10 years ago, it would have been a lot easier to handle. If we let it go another 10 years, it may be virtually impossible to handle. I mean, it's understood. We know it has to be done. There are feasible measures, very feasible measures, which could mitigate the crisis lead to a much better world, a survivable world, which we could go on to develop further, pursue some of these other things we've been talking about. But none of that will be possible unless this challenge is met and met soon. And unfortunately, it's, well, maybe fortunately, for your generation, there's a challenge that has never arisen in human history that's hard to bear in one respect, but an exciting prospect in another. It's in your hands to determine whether organized human society will survive. My generation failed miserably on this. Now it's your turn. So I remember last time you mentioning you don't go on social media much, but you read a lot about it. Um, so for this next question, 
for children growing up in a digital world where most of our information we consume is fed by algorithms made by large corporations and they're not self sought out. How would you reimagine the usage of digital learning tools to teach children how to think and generate new frameworks for thought rather than simply regurgitating trending talking points? Well, I'm an old fashioned conservative. I think the best way to learn to think is, for example, to go to the local library or to the university library, find books, find other people who want to discuss them, form groups where you talk about them, kind of what we did in graduate school. I think that's a lot better than being obsessed with social media. I got my own education. Anecdote again, I got mostly because I was lucky to get to get a fellowship at Harvard, which didn't pay much, but allowed me to have a desk at Widener Library. Fantastic library, one of the best libraries in the world. So you go in there in the morning, have a desk, do your work, walk around the stacks, find fascinating things, pick them up, go to the local bookstore, which used to exist, lots of them, and you find very interesting things. You find people who are looking at them, want to talk about it, you set up discussion groups, uh, you get an education. That's, uh, I don't know, any better way. Uh, maybe something can be done with digital systems, but I don't think it's going to be an increment. All of these things have to come basically from within. And the decline of reading is very serious. I, I can see it all the time, just in my own life. I, I get tons of mail, a lot of it from young people, a lot of good questions. Uh, they want to know what's your reason for saying this, what's the source, and so on. But they want a source that's online. I mean, I've had letters from kids in fancy prep schools, the fancy schools in New England where rich kids go, a uh, high educational standard, saying uh, things like, uh, I have an assignment for next week on so-and-so. Uh, can you give me some advice as to what I can look at? So I say, well, in the library across the street, you can find this and that book, which could be helpful. I get a letter back saying, no, I want something online. I can't walk across the street. I want to just push a button. Well, you're not going to have critical thinking that way. I agree. <laughs> um, maybe they should attend more Noam Chomsky Q and A's and maybe <laughs> that'll help too. Um, but kind of, you kind of touched on it like for a second, but you've been quoted saying, if we don't believe in freedom of expression for people we despise, we don't believe in it at all. Would you revise this now or qualify it or change it? Not at all, more so than ever. That's been true always. The cancel culture, as it's called, is very familiar. It's existed all my life, but it's been directed against the left, so nobody paid attention to it. I could give you plenty of examples from my own experience. What's changed now is that some sectors of young people who regard themselves as on the left have picked up some of the standard devices that have been used for years to suppress freedom of speech. It's wrong in principle, it's tactically suicidal. Principle I think is obvious, the tactics, you can see what happens. It's a gift to the right. You drive somebody off campus because you don't like what they're saying they love it. It's a shot in the arm for them. They could stand up as defenders of freedom and justice against the left-wing totalitarians. 
You want to have a reasonable response to them, invite, have them come on campus, set up, if you want to, an alternative meeting where you discuss their ideas, expose them, let people think about them. Uh, you'll pretty soon find they don't even want to come to campus. That's the way you deal with ideas you don't like, not by trying to suppress them. That's tactics. But the more important thing is principle. If you think about the statement you quoted, uh, Stalin and Hitler were perfectly happy to support speech that they liked. We don't consider them defenders of freedom of speech. And that question was from the College of SBS, and so is this next one. Um, the U.S.-China relationship is getting worse after Tiananmen Square, but China has serious human rights issues in Hong Kong. Will China be a threat to the world, as some politicians claim? And will China be authority right-wing or authority left-wing in the future, in your opinion? Well, there's not much that China can do about our problems. And there's not much we can do about their problems. We can object to things we think are wrong. Uh, they can object to things they think are wrong, but there's not much more than that. Now, what about, is China a threat to the world? I mean, is the United States a threat to the world when it uh, institutes essentially Jim Crow style policies to bar minorities from voting? It's a threat to the American people. It's not a threat to the world. China carries out human rights abuses in Xinjiang province. It's, we should protest it, should say it's wrong, but we should also say, what about the comparable or worse problems that we are carrying out right now? And they exist. So for example, to take one striking example, uh, it's claimed that uh, a million people went through China's Uyghurs, went through China's re-education camps and suffered pretty severe human rights abuses. That's a million people. Certainly shouldn't happen. There ha happens to be the biggest open air prison in the world, which has two million people in it, a million children, Gaza it's called, which is subjected to some of the worst human rights abuses in the world. They don't even have water to drink. Uh, power stations have been crushed and destroyed. Sewage systems destroyed. Constant murderous attacks. No pretext. Using American weapons. When they run, this is Israel. When they run out of weapons, they turn to the big boy across the ocean who is replenishing the weapons. This just happened again a few days ago when Congress voted another billion dollars to, re, to replenish uh, 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 military equipment that Israel expended during the war. It was defended on human rights grounds. They said, well, you, this is the Iron Dome defensive system. Can't prevent people from defending themselves. Did anybody suggest providing something to help the people of Gaza defend themselves from incomparably worse attacks. That doesn't cross our minds. We're committed to severe human rights abuses, easily comparable to anything that's described in Xinjiang province. Do we do anything about it? No, we object to the threat posed by others. Well, somebody mentioned the categorical imperative earlier, so let's think about it. Uh, let's think about the golden rule, you know, other famous moral principles. We should be thinking, we should, or know thyself, the Delphic Oracle. We should first ask ourselves, what can we do? We can protest what other people are doing. Can't do much about it. We can do something about what we're doing. We didn't get excited about Russian apparatchiks who condemned the U.S. war in Vietnam. 
yeah, that's easy. If they condemned the practices of the Soviet Union, we honored and respected them. Sakharov, Solzhenitsyn and others, same principles apply here. Well, let's talk about the question of threats. China is internally highly repressive, highly authoritarian, doing lots of things it shouldn't be doing. Those are completely wrong. They're threats to the people of China. They're not threats to us. China's doing some things internationally, which are wrong, in fact, in violation of international law. So in the South China Sea, China's taking actions which are in violation of international law. Is the United States in any position to protest about them? We're the only maritime country that doesn't even accept the law, okay? We're a country that carries out piracy on the high seas, the greatest maritime crime. When we, the US Navy, intercepts, intercepts boats, ships, carrying, which they claim are carrying Iranian oil to Venezuela and drives them to American ports, that's piracy subject to the death penalty, the worst maritime crime. Do we say anything about it? Yeah, we applaud. Yeah, we're doing the right thing. So we're, in general, in no position to uh, object to China's violations, and they are violations, in the South China Sea. These should be dealt with by regional powers. The U.S. can back them if it likes through negotiations, diplomacy, settlement accommodations, as in many other places. Uh, there are the th what we call the threat of China is not in the Caribbean. It's not on the borders of California. It's on the borders of China. What we call the threat of China is on China's borders. What we call the threat of Russia is on Russia's borders. That should get us to think for a minute. Uh, we might also ask, is China maybe th facing a threat? China is ringed with missiles, with nuclear armed missiles from hundreds of US bases, some of the 800 and so bases that the US has around the world, many of them surrounding China, armed with nuclear armed missiles. China has one in Djibouti in Africa. Is China maybe facing a threat? Are we facing a threat? In fact, you know, we're not totally secure, nobody is, but we are more secure than any country in the world. I mean, 9-11 was a big surprise, but remember, it's the first time that the U.S. territory was attacked since 1812. Can you think of any other country like that? We attack others. We don't get attacked. Okay. So yes, we should be serious about the threats that exist and work to mitigate them. And what we are actually doing is working to accelerate and exacerbate them. So the response to the alleged China threat is not to send a naval armada into the South China Sea any more than they should respond to us by sending an armada into the Caribbean. Okay, that's not the answer. The answer is not to send, make a deal with Australia to provide them with nuclear submarines, which are advertised publicly by US high, high figures as being able to sink the Chinese Navy in three days and are able to appear in Chinese ports unannounced at any time, armed with nuclear weapons. That's not the way to reduce tensions and uh, problems. It's a way to instigate a hostile reaction, 
which can then escalate in the familiar cycle, even get out of control, in which case we're all dead. Finished. We can't have a war with China or any other nuclear state. The state that initiates the war will be destroyed. Uh, so that's out of the question. And we should think about the fact that the US strategic posture 2018 under Trump so far carried over under Biden, even extended. The strategic posture is to prepare, prepare to win simultaneous wars against Russia and China. That's carrying insanity to the point beyond where words exist to describe it. You can't have a nuclear war with either of them and expect civilization to describe, to survive. Well, these are things we ought to be thinking about. And a lot of them are right before our eyes. The nuclear sub deal is just a couple of weeks ago. And this next question is from the College of SBS. What is a question you wish people asked you more? And what would be your answer to that question? Well, probably the one that comes most is from people your age, what I'm guessing is your age, uh, who say, I'm lost, I don't know what to do. I can't figure out what to do with my life. Everything seems too hard and impossible. Uh, what can I do? That's some variant of that is probably the most common question. And it's the kind of question that should come to mind for somebody your age, came to my mind when I was your age. It's the kind of thing you should be thinking about, but not asking for any advice about. We've talked about that. Is there a particular question that you wished people asked you about? Like, is there a topic that's like really niche or something you wish people asked you about? Or I guess you could, you could ask everything, huh? <laughs> Under the sun. A number of the questions that were asked here, I think should be asked a lot more, including the more far reaching ones. We should ask the question whether working people and farmers, many of them without formal education in the late 19th century, whether they were correct in agreeing with two millennia of Western thought that subordination to a master is intolerable. I think people should be asking that. Do you have to accept it? I don't think so. There are other forms of social organization, like the ones that farmers and workers without formal education were striving for. If you read their press, very lively labor press, a lot of it written by young women, incidentally, were called factory girls, women who were driven off the farms into the mills, had their own very lively, very interesting press. It's all available, even online. And, you can, <laughs> and uh, very interesting reason, reading, very thoughtful, lots of ideas, and working towards some conception of kind of cooperative commonwealth of people working together, mutual aid, mutual support, common interests, not just I'm out for myself to be ahead of the next guy, not that. Uh, well, that's very valuable to think about. And I, so kind of in that same vein, um, what is one of your top issues that's on your mind right now? And what gives you hope about it or do not have hope about it or et cetera? Well, right now, there are two topics that should be on the top of everyone's mind. One of them 
going back to what you said before, what question do I wish were asked more? Here's one. What can we do about the increasing and ominous threat of nuclear war? It is very serious. It's growing. It's worse than it has been, with a very few exceptions, for 75 years. Uh, and there's almost no attention being paid to it. Neither political party is interested. The media aren't interested. Take a look at the political conventions. Nothing was said about it. It's one of the two major, major threats to survival of organized human life on Earth. They're comparable threats. And that's what should be on the top of our minds. One is, and it's beginning to get some attention, at least the threat of environmental destruction. Uh, it's not just heating the atmosphere, habitat destruction, pollution of the oceans, uh, destruction of possibilities of agricultural production, all of that is combined into environmental destruction. Left on our present course, we will soon reach irreversible tipping points. Doesn't mean everybody's gonna die tomorrow, but we will be on a course which can't be changed towards essentially destruction of organized human life on earth. That's one. The other is the severe and growing threat of nuclear war. That should be on the top of our minds. And that one is not being discussed at all. Now, in both of these cases, we know how to deal with them. The means are there, feasible means within grasp can make a better world. We're not taking them. Those are two things that should be on the top of our minds. Another thing that should be on the top of our minds is the collapse of the social order. It's not as tangible, but it's very real. The collapse of an atmosphere of rational interchange and discourse. It shows up in many ways. You take a look at polls of people's attitudes. It's shocking, really shocking. Could go through examples. And people have moved into such impenetrable bubbles, they can't even talk to each other about it. Families break up over whether you're going to vote Republican or Democrat. I mean, it's, it's just, it's a reflection of the collapse of the social order. The effects of what I described earlier, uh, 40 years of an assault on the general population forced atomization, disruption, breakdown of social organization, attack on labor unions, the main means of defense, uh, turning people into a society of uh, atomized people living a precarious existence. That's gonna lead, have effects on the moral and intellectual climate and it's having them, that's serious. Uh, these choices incidentally are not just my own. Those of you who follow the course of the famous doomsday clock, the clock of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which was established in 1947 after the atom bombings, so try to give a concise picture of the state of the world. The, the hands of the clock are set a certain distance from midnight based on analysis of the word situation. Midnight means termination. Uh, it was set at seven minutes to midnight in 1947, oscillated over the years. Since the Trump administration, every year it's been moved closer to midnight. A couple of years ago, it reached the closest point it had ever been, two minutes to midnight. After that, the analysts abandoned minutes they moved to seconds. It's now 100 seconds to midnight. 
my guess is next January, it'll probably move closer. Uh, well, they mentioned three major things. One, the growing threat of nuclear weapons. Two, the threat of environmental destruction and the fact that leaders in the world are not acting to respond to it. The third, the breakdown of an atmosphere of rational, civilized interchange. Now, it might sound as if that doesn't belong with the first two, but it does. Because if you can't overcome that, there'll never be a way of dealing with the others. So those are the things that I think should be uppermost in our minds. This next question is from the College of SBS. Um, they thank you for sharing your insights so far. Um, and they want to know, how would you account for human greed in your idea of a stateless socialist system or anti-capitalist in general? I don't think human greed is, it's certainly a, a aspect of human nature. So is kindness and sympathy. Uh, human nature incorporates both. Uh, each of us by our nature could be a saint or a sinner. Probably we're all a mixture of each. Uh, well, how it eventuates in the course of the way a human person grows and develops is in part heavily influenced by the social system in which you're in, the prevailing ideologies, the, the, what's called prevailing common sense, what's taken for granted. Uh, part of it is just your own will and choice. Uh, nobody understands that, but science has nothing to say about it. We all know we have that option. Well, that turns into whether you're a person who wants to, to go back to my lesson on libertarian thought 75 years ago, depends, that's the kind, determines whether you're the kind of person who cheers at the idea that if we could only get rid of the government, we'd get rid of unemployment. If you want to cheer at that, you're one kind of person. If you're abhorred by that, you're a different kind of person. They're both within the range of human nature. And someone from the College of SPS just wants to clarify, what is the increasing threat of nuclear war they referencing? Is it belligerence between nuclear powers? Is it a heightened risk of acquisition of nuclear weapons by non-nuclear powers? Is it abandonment of treaties? Or um, in what terms are you speaking of? Well, that's a very important question. And it's a shame that it even has to be asked. It's a shame that it's not constantly discussed and in the forefront of our attention. So in fact, everything that was mentioned, I mentioned the exorbitant military budgets. This is at a time when we badly need resources. Close to a trillion dollars for us is being spent mostly in waste, preparation for destruction, a lot of it for developing more destructive weapons, which will eliminate us as well. So one thing is developing, is even having and developing more destructive weapons. US is moving towards militarization of space, violation of the Outer Space Treaty. That's lunacy. It's destructive for everyone, including us. They're not gonna be able to control it. We initiate militarization of space, others will follow. We're all in more danger. Uh, take, there, over the last 60 years, there has been painful, slow moves towards trying to control, to put, not to put this genie back into the bottle, but at least make it harder for her to get out to control the threat, arms control agreements, started with Eisenhower, with the beginnings of the Open Skies Treaty, then other presidents since, big step forward with Reagan, under intensive popular pressure, hugest demonstrations in history here in the United States, opposing 
short range missiles in Europe, which greatly increased the threat of war. Finally, Reagan and Gorbachev reached an agreement, 1987, to ban these weapons that substantially increased the likelihood of peace. There was an anti-ABM treaty, very important. Every strategic analyst knows that although ABM sounds defensive, it's actually an offensive weapon. It's a weapon that says, maybe we can somehow fend off a first strike so we can destroy the enemy with a second strike. It's an offensive weapon. Everyone understands that. You put ABMs on the Russian border, it's a threat to them and they understand it, okay? There was an anti-ABM treaty. Uh, there were other treaties. The Republican Party in this century has been dismantling them. George W. Bush dismantled the ABM treaty. When Trump came along, he wanted to dismantle everything. Trump's general policy was wrecking ball. He dismantled the INF treaty, intermediate range miss missile treaty, uh, was moving towards destroying the open skies treaty, was just about to end the last of the standing treaties, the new START treaty, which limits Russian and American nuclear weapons. There are way too many of them, but this at least limits them. That was due to expire on February 5th. Biden was elected just in time within hours to ratify the treaty as the Russians had been imploring the US to do. So that one's still there. Much of the rest has been dismantled. Well, those there's another treaty called the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which we signed, which obligates us to pursue good faith measures to eliminate nuclear weapons. There's a treaty in force now, a few months ago, international treaty signed by 120 so countries calling for the prohibition of development of nuclear weapons. Well, not one nuclear state has signed it, but we could have a role in influencing other states to move towards it. And there are many other things that could be done, plenty of them. Uh, just mention one, which is immediate. One very positive move would be to establish nuclear weapons free zones in the world. So regions which say we don't want to have anything to do with nuclear weapons, doesn't get rid of them, but it's significant. There are quite a few, but they can't go into force primarily because of us. There's a nuclear weapons free zone in the Pacific, can't go into force because the United States insists on maintaining nuclear weapons uh, facilities on its Pacific islands. There's an African uh, nuclear weapons free zone treaty, can't go into force because the United States maintains a nuclear armed military base on an island which under Af international law belongs to Africa. It was a British island and Britain, which is by now just a vassal of the United States, agreed to, to oppose international law and to insist on holding the island in violation of the United Nations World Court to drive out all the population. So the US could establish a military base there, which was raised by Obama to a nuclear base. It's not symbolic. It's the base that's used for bombing Central Asia and the Middle East. So the African treaty can't go into effect. There is a Western hemisphere treaty. Well, two countries block it, the United States and Canada. We insist on nuclear weapons. The most important such zone would be the Middle East, a highly volatile region. A nuclear weapons zone and the weapons free zone in the Middle East would end 
the alleged threat of Iran. Iran is supposed to be a major threat. Its nuclear weapons programs are on the front pages, terrible danger. What can we do? Well, one thing we could do, of course, is go back to the treaty that we pulled out of, which uh, was terminating development of them. If we don't want to do that, we could move towards a nuclear weapons free zone in the region. Well, with intensive expect inspections, we know they can work. They worked very well before the US pulled out of the joint agreement with Iran. Uh, so we could move to that. Is there any opposition to it? Certainly not in the region. The Arab states have been pressing for it for 25 years. Iran is strongly in favor of it. The whole global south is in favor of it. Europe has no objections. When it comes up in international forums, the US vetoes it. Most recently, President Obama in 2015. And everyone knows exactly why, but don't say. We can't allow Israel's nuclear weapons to be inspected. Sometimes this comes out into the open in strange ways. A couple of months ago, the New York Times, for the first time ever, had an editorial saying, gee, why don't we establish a nuclear weapons-free zone in the Middle East that would end the Iranian threat? Caveat, footnote, Israel's nuclear weapons are non-negotiable. So the one nuclear state in the region can't be examined. Well, is that a good reason to lay a basis for major threats, possible war, murderous sanctions, provocative actions, interchanges that could blow up at any time? I don't think so. I think if the American people knew about it, they wouldn't think so. Try to find some discussion of it. You can find it in arms control journals. I write about it other outsiders write about it. Should be talking about questions that should be asked. That's another one. Front and center. A very important question which could terminate very serious problems. So there are threats of nuclear war, provocative actions on the China border, the Russian border, development of new weapons. We're not alone in this. China and Russia are also developing dangerous new weapons. All of this can be brought to an end by treaty, treaties, diplomacy, negotiation, not by provocation. Well, I think I'm... So I think we have time for one more question. Um, this will be the last one. How do you overcome the status quo bias when discussing the benefits of socialism versus capitalism? Well, first of all, we ought to think about what we, we mean by the word socialism. Socialism was a banned word in the United States till a few years ago. The United States is a very interesting country, the culture. In every country in the world that I can think of outside of dictatorships, to say that I'm a socialist is like saying I'm a Democrat. It's not even a question, you know. In fact, if you're a communist, you can run for office. The United States is unique in that these words were outlawed. Couldn't mention them. I want to know something more. The word capitalism was outlawed. You're too young to remember, but in the 1960s, the main activist movement, young, the movement of young activists was uh, Students for a Democratic Society was the main student activist popular movement. One of the presidents of SDS, marvelous guy, Paul Potter, uh, gave a presidential address in, I think, the late 60s, in which he said, he talked about the problems we're facing, the war, this and that. He said, we have to get the courage to name the system. We've never named the system before. And there was a kind of a gasp, you know, 
could he name the system? Actually, if you look back, he couldn't say the word. The system is capitalism. You weren't allowed to say that, that's too scary. Uh, well, the country is, now it's a little better, you can say the word, but what do people mean by it? What people mean is mostly Sanders's programs. I'm in favor of Sanders's programs. I've always supported him. I think he's a great guy. His programs are mild social democracy. As I said, his main proposals would enable him to run on the conservative party program in Germany. So what do we mean by socialism? Well, and think about that. Do we mean what it always meant in the past? distant past, the position of American workers and farmers who didn't call themselves socialists, it's never been heard of it. They just called themselves actually Republicans, people who wanted to save their Republican free virtues as free men, even free women, uh, which was new. Well, that was original socialism. Working people ought to control the enterprises in which they work. People ought to control their own communities. There shouldn't be bosses, shouldn't be concentrations of power. Nobody should have to rent themselves to survive. Well, that's what socialism used to mean long ago. It's mostly been forgotten in Europe too. So do we want to contrast that with state capitalism? I think there's a pretty good case for doing so. But uh, there's a lot of barriers to overcome. Lots of uh, psychological, ideological barriers, terms that are almost too scary to utter, like capitalism not many years ago. Okay. These are things to overcome, a lot of work to do everywhere. Yeah, well, with that, we now conclude the Q&A. Um, I just want to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. It was such a pleasure to hear from you all. Um, and we really appreciate you submitting all your questions. And of course, thank you, Professor Chomsky, for giving us, giving us your time. And especially thank you to our sponsors, the Agnes Snell's Howery Program and ASUA. If you want to learn more about Professor Noam Chomsky, all up-to-date information is on chomsky.arizona.edu. That is C-H-O-M-S-K-Y dot A-R-I-Z-O-N-A dot E-D-U. The recording of this Q&A will be uploaded to YouTube later this semester, and that link will be sent to you then. Again, I want to acknowledge and thank Sydney Mathis for helping assist me in this Q&A today, and thank you to all the SBS online ambassadors who wish you, Professor Chomsky, the best. I also want to give a special shout out to all the administrators in the College of SBS for entrusting me for a second time and giving me this opportunity again. It was such an honor. Thank you again, everybody, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good to talk to you. Got to go out and take care of my dogs. <laughs> They've been yes. very polite.